Uh, we are having our uh, third lecture in the physics course. Uh, we have studied so far the properties of porous materials, porosity, permeability, and how can we measure them? How can we uh, model them? Uh, we went through bundle of tube theory and then found the permeability of a tube and then for a porous medium as well, a tube permeability was R square over eight for porous uh, sample of tubes with porosity five would be five R square over eight. Then we spoke about hydraulic radius. Kalman Kozeni at the end gave us a formula for permeability uh, with the factor one over instead of 72, it was 150 to 180. And that was due to, due to tortuosity, that the flow path in the porous medium is not just a straight tube way, it's, it's uh, very much twisted and, and it has expansion contractions and, and is a lot more complex than, than what it would be sampled with, uh, with tubes, straight tubes of even complex cross section. And then we studied flow in porous medium. We said that we have mass conservation and instead of momentum conservation, we use Darcy's law and that would give us a flow equation for potential minus divergence K over viscosity gradient of potential was zero if there was no source term. We solved it for sand pack column, water column on the top and a porous material on the bottom. And we found the potential distribution and pressure distribution. We could also use that to find what the velocity, what's the discharge rate or the flow rate across this sample. Would We didn't do that, you're gonna do that for your homework. And it's quite important to find the velocity distribution as well. Velocity and also Q, which is the uh, flow rate. Now today we are gonna start to do something really important, as important as other topics as well. And that's when you come to the reality, there is something that we have been always saying that in, po in natural porous media, the matter of a scale is very important and you have to consider crossing the scale and especially to go up to the scale from very, very tiny uh, scales. You many times need to go across this and go to the upper and coarser scale. So that, that concept is called upscale. So that's the lecture of today. We are gonna speak about heterogeneity properties and anisotropy as well. And then we are gonna speak about upscaling of, of 1D flows properties. I mean, finding effective probability for 1D reservoirs, which are heterogeneous. And then we go to multidimensional upscaling as well. We stay in analytical upscaling by the way here, you're gonna see uh, how. So since the other ones are numerical based upscalings that you can do that with your, uh, with your modeling course as well. So the two courses are actually uh, connected and intertwined together and uh, one would help the other. This one also will help the other one as well. Here we stay analytical, numerical part will be covered in the modeling course. The concept of heterogeneity has not been just, you know, it's not just totally new to you. You have seen it in your uh, uh, studies already so far, but this is just to set the right basis for, for uh, the course that we have uh, together as well. So the Heterogeneity means change of the property across the physical space, the spatial coordinate. So that's the spatial coordinate that you have if you change your location from here, for example, you locate at this point or you go to this point or you go to this point, you see the property changes. And this change of the property means that your permeability, for example, in this case is heterogeneous. It could have very low values. For example, blue, if blue shows low value, you have regions of low values. You have regions of extremely high values. If red is high value, these are the, these are the for example, zones that you have very high, high permeable zone as well. So the concept that permeability or porosity are functions of a space of coordinate X, it means that they are heterogeneous. If they are not changing their values with the space, they are homogeneous. Most, if not all of natural porous media are heterogeneous. Their properties change because of different depositions, different layers that you have in the subsurface. Uh, it could be like this one, which is, uh, which is quite patchy. You could have layered field as well. 
that's heterogeneity. There is another important concept here, and that's when the permeability actually is not just changing its properties with the space, but also it has a different value depending on the direction that you are, you are speaking about. If you, are, if you want to have flow in this direction, you will see that the potential gradient in, or pressure gradient, let's say this is uh, eta one direction, potential gradient in eta one direction is given, then you would have to multiply it with permeability in eta one direction over viscosity. For example, if it is uh, diagonal as well, I'm simplifying the problem, but it's, it's gonna be a lot more clear about the full, the full complexity will be a lot more clear at the end of the lecture as well to you. Imagine I need to multiply it by this permeability that is across this. That's how easy flow can happen in this direction. Now imagine you can have also another direction, eta two, for which then you need potential gradient across, across this eta two. And then you need permeability across this eta two. Imagine the flow can easily flow in the horizontal direction, this, this one, eta one, but actually cannot flow across this layer. Then it means that permeability in the normal in eta two is zero or very low. Flow cannot go in this direction. It can go mainly on the other direction. This is that you are speaking about permeability in one location. The location is constant. The only thing is that what direction you can flow easier. Or would you flow in different directions differently? And that actually happens in nature because of upscaling. Because when we go through microchannels, upscale the properties, and then still we need to lower our resolutions because we can't really go for centimeter scale description of the properties. You see that the layering effect that you see here, for example, these layering effects of high permeability, low permeability, and so, they can orient the flow. They can say that across us, you will have different flow properties than parallel to us. If you want to, if you want to find one effective property for the entire box here, entire box here, then you would find a property that would say flow across this would have a permeability of this much and flow normal to it would have a different permeability. This is anisotropy. And if you have permeability, which is directional, which means that in this direction, you have different permeability than in the normal direction, then it is anisotropy. If the permeability is equal in every direction you can consider, in every direction you can consider, it does not change its value. Then you have isotropic medium, isotropic, which means direction doesn't change my property. Anisotropic medium is the medium that has different properties for different orientation of the flow. It helps flow in X direction better than in Y direction, for example. And that comes mainly because, because of layering effect, because of layered system that you have. Now with these two concepts set, I'd like to go and do a little bit more quantitative analysis. And see, imagine then, let's go to the real K. So far, whatever K we have, we have studied has been only a constant scalar. We have been always saying K based on Kalman Kozeni, based on bundle up to you, based on this, has this value. We always gave one quantity to K. Reality is that in real life, permeability is a tensor. And due to the upscaling fact, also it gets a full tensorial property. What would it really mean? What would a permeability, which is full tensor, means? Let's look at the quantitative analysis of this and see what does it really imply. 
I have velocity u, which in three dimension, it's a vector, can be written as u in x direction, u in y direction, u in z direction. That's my u vector. That will be equal to minus k over viscosity gradient potential, right? That's my Darcy's law. This means I have minus one over viscosity, a permeability which is a tensor times gradient of potential is what? Is d phi dx, d potential dy, d potential dz. And we are all studying incompressible flow in this course because that would mean a little bit different in here. So uh, potential is actually P plus rho GZ, rho is constant. What we have said so far in the class is that here, here there will be a K, there will be a constant value, four milli Darcy, five Darcy, three milli Darcy. The reality is, that after upscaling, you will get a K value, a K value, which is not a scalar. It's a full tensor. What does full tensor mean? It means you have KXX, KXY, KXZ here. You will have K, YX, K, Y, Y, K, Y, Z here, and you will have K, Z, X, K, Z, Y, K, Z, Z. We used to say that this permeability was just one quantity, but actually it is not. In reality, it is not. It can have all these different entries, especially if you define it after upscaling. Now, in reality, what would this really mean? This means that let's write ux. The whole study holds for all the other velocities. What would be the ux? Can someone help me with, with understanding what ux now is? Uh, the, the first row of the matrix multiplying the vector. Absolutely. I need to multiply the first vector multiplied by the here by this vector, which may be minus one over mu times k x x d phi dx plus k x y d phi dy plus k x z d phi dz. Now I'd like to ask one of you, maybe Yara, can you help me understand this? Because without these two terms, without these two terms, I understand this first part. It says that if you have a sample and you impose potential difference across X axis, so this is my X axis, and this is my y-axis. If I post phi here, one, and phi here, two, in x direction, if the two are different with permeability in x direction, I know what would be the flow, what would be the velocity. What does the second term mean? What potential gradient or difference does it imply? In the horizontal direction? This, d, d yep. phi d y. What direction? Yeah, that's in the vertical direction. Vertical direction. Yeah. So this means if you have phi in y direction at cross section one, phi at y direction, cross section two, the difference between phi one and phi two in the vertical direction could cause velocity in x direction. 
So change of the potential across y axis can also cause velocity across x axis. How can this happen? In what case can potential difference across y axis drive flow in x axis? Evolve, um, do you have any idea? No, I'm thinking about it, but yeah, think about it because this is a, this is exactly the sub, you know subject or the title of the course today, and that's exactly what you should really get to the real maybe, life. Maybe it has to do with uh, if the step size is not infinitely small in y direction, it's also influenced. Uh, it also influences the flow in x direction. Was it Pelé who spoke? Yes, correct. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, you said that if, if the size of the sample. If, if the step size in y direction is not infinitely small, it will yeah, also yeah. influence. It, it, it's exit. not mainly, you know, it's implicitly impacted by the size of, or the sample or upscaling. But the main, the main drive is what, Fela? You said that, well, we have, uh, what is it, d phi dy. When d phi dy would have no impact on the x velocity? When would it be the case? The multiplier should be? It should be zero. Exactly. When the multiplier is zero, then d phi dy wouldn't have any impact. If d phi, if this kxy is not zero, then you are gonna have impact of this. So then when you have kxy non-zero, your y direction potential drop would impose some x direction velocity. When would this happen in reality? When you have layered permeability to upscale, when it is representing a layered field, because then the flow is actually along these, along these lines, which has some trajectory in x and some trajectories in y. Imagine you have layered channels. You impose X direction and Y di or you impose Y direction potential drop. Flow is actually going aligned. It has some angle. So it will, it will actually not going exactly to X or Y in general. It's going through something that has some projection in X, some projection in Y. That's the case then that KXY is non-zero when you are upscaling a layered field in which y direction, y direction potential drop would cause not only potentially y direction flow, but also x direction too. And that's because you are, you are actually layered. Imagine you have a, a layer, perfect layer like this in your reservoir. You know that the layer is only, permeability is only along this axis and you will have also vertical one here. There is no X, Y here. Now imagine instead of doing that, you have taken a sample like this here. You rotate your sample and you impose, you call this to be X and you call this to be Y. Then if I rotate this sample and make it horizontal looking for X and Y, your permeability would be looking like this which means if you impose X direction potential difference, your flow is actually going to be like that, which means it's going to go through X direction and Y direction with sinus and cosine relationships. It will have partly in X, partly in Y. And that's- So, so, yeah, so this ahead. case is just caused by the flow direction. That's precisely the implication of permeability representing a layering, layering effect. With, with, without any relation to other, other factors, just to the di direction because. Well, it says that the potential drop across X and across Y and across Z could also impose velocity across X direction. If they can do that, it means that their permeability tensor has non-zero elements in the off-diagonal terms. 
otherwise they wouldn't influence uh, uh, yeah, otherwise yeah, yeah. they wouldn't influence the flow in x direction oh, and okay, this, yeah. this yeah. happens now it becomes more clear if i proceed with this course and you see here let me just go back this is exactly in the written form it's like that your velocity x y z will have k x x x y x z and so on times the potential gradient that's the typed in the text that I just draw with my with my pen for you. And now this means that you have x you, velocity in any direction like x would depend on potential gradients generally on all directions if these terms are non-zero. If these terms are non-zero. Now we have a case of orthotropic case where this permeability can be written actually diagonally there is a principal axis for the permeability tensor, which actually across that axis, your permeability would have only diagonal entries and no off diagonal. Which means that you have, let's say principal axis is only X and Y. So you have this type of layered field that you have obscate, and then you will have a permeability across X, permeability across Y, and no x, y. That's when you have a still an isotropy. You still are direction dependent, but you don't have full tensorial effect anymore. Gradient potential across the vertical direction would not impose your horizontal direction. Now imagine your layered field was like that. Of course, your principal axis of permeability would be this one eta 1 and eta 2. If you put your x and y axis rotated along with, with the permeability direction, then you would get diagonal entries. You wouldn't see any off diagonal. If you now rotate your axis to make them look horizontal, like this x and y, then you will naturally observe off diagonal entries in your permeability matrix as well. So that's the matter of rotating. So if you rotate this, you will see off diagonal entries come. So it's really about permeability structures that are aligned and that are actually uh, having some angles with respect to the axis you have defined for your reservoir to simulate or to model to quantify. Okay. Now, an isotropy goes even more difficult uh, in real life because the direction of permeability in each grid block can be different than the other grid block. So you have an isotropy and you have heterogeneity and they can just change everywhere as well. But these are just the, the, the introduction to these concepts. We are going to practice about them as well. And especially next courses, we'll get a lot more uh, information about, uh, much more information about uh, stratigraphy, about depositions, about the geology, and then upscaling comes, multi-scale modeling also comes. Uh, you will get to know them a lot in more details. I'd like to ask you to read some articles about it or some sort of textbooks, especially those I have given you as references as well. But I hope that this was enough for introducing you to this, to this subject. Now I'd like to go and say, if I have diagonal matrix for my permeability, my permeability would look like this in my formula, which then means that velocity in x direction would be minus kxx viscosity d phi dx velocity in y direction would be minus k y y viscosity d phi dy and my velocity in z direction would be minus k z z over mu d phi d z. So potential in x direction would be needed for x velocity, potential in y direction would be needed for y velocity and z as well. There would be no influence of potential in y direction for flow in x direction because we have rotated our axis to be in parallel or in the system that is actually in the in the principal axis of the permeability okay? and many times it's not easy to find those axes so you will get full tensorial effect for permeability easily 
typed in beautifully is here like this. Your X will have impact by potential in X direction, Y with potential in Y, Z by Z. But we know that in general form, it's not always the case. So with that, I'd like to now go and do some upscaling. Let's get those things and get the effective permeability so to get better understanding of what these mean. First, I do one dimensional analytical. Then at the end, we do multi-dimensional analytical. Numerical will be in the modeling course, in the modeling course, simulation, reservoir simulation course. And the code that you have already obtained in the last practical session of modeling course allows you to upscaling as well. In fact, one of the exam questions that I had from students was that I gave them permeability distribution in, in, in the exam and I asked them to use their code and uh, de design a specific boundary conditions to find the effective permeability based on flow-based upscaling. So this is a code that you already have and it allows you to do that easily, much very easily. Anyhow, let's do this part. I, I covered the first part and then we go to break and come back, finish the course. Imagine I have a layered domain like this here. I have layered domain like this, K1 with the width of H1 or depth of H1. I have another layered reservoir, which is with K2, the position is here. It has H2 thickness, K3 thickness, H3, K4, H4. I impose potential one on the left, potential two on the right, with the length of my reservoir being capital L. I see that in each layer, I will get some flux, some Q, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, depending on their permeability, naturally, right? If permeability is high, I get higher flow rate. If permeability is low, I get lower flow rates. My question is this, my question is this. How can I find an effective permeability for the entire medium, which would give me the same total Q if I would impose phi one and phi two across the same length of that block? What would be the effective permeability that could represent this layer system? Remember we are in Cartesian system and flow is parallel to the layer system. So we have flow, which is parallel to the layering configurations. How do you think I could find the effective permeability? What would be the basis to find that? I'd like to ask you spend uh, 10, 20 seconds or so, think about this, uh, see, see how would you how would you do this calculation or analysis to obtain an effective property that represents, represents such a layered system horizontally aligned with the flow direction? So I'm going to pause my record. Okay, I resume the recording. So Edgar, go ahead. What do you think could be the basis for us to do this upscaling? Okay, we should use the Darcy law. We should use Darcy's law. Yeah. yeah. What would Darcy's law give us? A relationship between a rate and- Fantastic, a relationship between the potential drop and the flow rate. That's rate. precisely the case. So we are gonna use Darcy's law for sure. I have one more question from you, Edgar, is that now I have Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 in each layer, okay? I have Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 for each layer, okay? What do you think would work or would hold for Q total here? Is there any relationship between this Q total and these Q1, 2, 3, 4? Yes, it's the summation. Mm -hmm. Rates. So okay. the rate is the summation of 
Q2, Q3, and Q4. Total flux would be Q total would be Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus all of them. And I know from Darcy's law that Q for each layer is K divided by viscosity potential 1 minus potential 2 divided by L. So I, this is velocity U multiplied by cross section area to give me the flux, the flow rate. Now I'm going to implement this into each individual term up. Q total is what? Q total is for the total system. It has K effective in it. So for Q total is K effective divided by viscosity phi one minus phi two over L times area. What is Q1 or Q2 or Q3? This is equal to Q1, which is K1 over mu phi 1 minus phi 2 over L times area for section 1. Area for section 1 plus K2 viscosity phi 1 minus phi 2 L area cross section 2 plus all other terms. I impose the same potential gradient between the equivalent sample. Then here, length is the same. And I know that put Q is velocity times area. What's the cross section area of the total sample? Is capital H times one. What's the cross section area of sample one? Is small h times one. Cross section area of sample two, I mean layer two, is h2 times one, and so on. And one other thing, we have imposed the same potential gradient across the entire sample. These terms are all the same. Viscosity of the fluid is the same everywhere. What do I get at the end of the day? I find that my K effective times capital H is K1 H1 plus K2 H2 all the way to the end, which means my K effective is nothing but a weighted arithmetic average of K1 H1, K2 H2, K3 H3, K4 H4 divided by H. And we know that H here is nothing but just H1 plus H2 plus H3. So, on. so that's the summation of all the gaps as well. That is my effective permeability if I want to assign one permeability for this homogenized effective medium. If I want to type what I just wrote for you, it would look like this. We know that total Q is Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q blah, blah, blah. We know each Q is cross-section area times velocity from Darcy's law. Here I write minus K over viscosity D phi because it's potential drop here. It's phi 2 minus phi 1. And then here I get the total flux which is with K effective. 
and it will be multiplied by cross-section area total. And with all these knowledge and inform you know, the formula, what I get is that total area times effective permeability would be area one K1, area two K2, area three K3. And at the end, it would look like this, meaning that we just multiply each layer with its permeability H1 times K1 plus H2 plus times K2 and so on. We find that would be our weighted arithmetic average. If I knew the continuum distribution, it wasn't layered based, it was function of K across the thickness that I could integrate instead of summation. But that's, that's not really necessary at this moment in time. We do usually layered based system in, in our course. Now, how about this one? Now I actually, made a, uh, already a, a draw in here. How about the, the one that has, um, that has, um, I'm sorry, I just bring my presentation back. Let me uh, stop share and see if I can correct my slides. Okay, let me reshare my screen okay now i go to the next configuration this configuration is not layered parallel to the flow this configuration is actually having flow rate which is normal having normal uh, layers of permeability across its flow path. The flow happens again between phi one and phi two, but I have a queue here of flux that happens across these media. Each medium has length of L1, here L2, here L3, here L4, and it has permeability one, two, three, four. And I want to find one effective property for the entire normally positioned layered system. Now, what would be the basis here? In the, in the horizontal one, in this one, in the parallel flow, our basis was that total flow rate is the summation of individual ones. And that helped us get the formula that K effective is arithmetic average of each layer flow rate permeability. What would we do here? What would be the basis here? We are gonna use Darcy's law, of course, but what is the other fundamental thing that we need to use in order to help us do the effective permeability calculation? The length instead of the edge. Go ahead, uh, Barbara, what is it? The length instead of H? Well, we have this L, of course. So each L is different and the summation of L1, L2, L3 and all of them would be, would be capital L. What can we say about flow rate? Is the total flow rate summation of individual flow rates of these ones or different? What can we say about Q total? in relationship with the flow that crosses sample one, sample two, sample three, sample four. It will be the subtraction of all the cues? It would be all of them. It would be equal to, to the flow that you would see there because whatever, whatever flows in layer one would go to layer two, would go to layer three, would go to layer four. It's incompressible flow. And so whatever comes should leave. So the flow that goes through all these layers is equal to the total flow that you would have. So Q total would be Q that crosses sample one would be equal to Q that would you know, go through sample two and all, all other, other Qs. Because this is, this is how incompressible mass balance would actually look like. Yeah. So 
velocities are, you know, or flow rates are all equal. So that's not something I could really use too much to find the effective permeability here. What can I use in order to find the effective permeability? What quantity is summation of individual quantities of the layer system? Let me write back your Darcy's law. Darcy's law says Q is U times area, which is K divided by viscosity phi 1 minus phi 2 divided by some length. Doesn't have to be capital L, L1, L2, L3, whatever, depending on what permeability you are using. Are using permeability 1, then it would be L1, permeability 2, L2. So I make it I times cross section area for your system I. What can we say about the potential drop? Here I have phi one and phi two across the entire sample, right? Can I say that the total potential drop, which is the potential that would happen between one and two, so I use it, yeah, that's okay. Can I say that the total pressure drop, a potential drop, if it's horizontal, then pressure drop, across my sample would actually be equal to the drop that happens in layer one, in layer two, and in all other layers. I am, for example, in this potential here, up the way to here. Potential drops a bit here, a bit here, depending on its permeability. If a little bit here and a little bit here. The total drop actually happens across each sample. This is potential drop one, this is potential drop two, and so on. The total potential drop will be the summation of individual drops in the potential for this flow. Does that make sense to you? Layer one makes some drop, layer two makes another drop, layer three makes another drop. This is the heterogeneous reservoir, by the way, that you have studied in your reservoir simulation 1D reservoir simulation as well. So the potential would drop, individual pieces would drop a piece of the whole. So based on Darcy's law, what is the potential drop? If I write Darcy's law based on potential drop, it will be minus Ki over viscosity delta phi over Li. So that would be the potential drop of section I times area I. So that would be Q, which means potential drop in any layer I would be what? Hmm? Would be minus Q, I have Q times L, Q, L is here. So L comes minus Q times L I. What else? Times viscosity. Viscosity divided by permeability of I. K I times A. Area I. So I write this for the entire system because I write Q, not QI, because I know Q is equal, is the same for all sections. So I write delta phi total is minus Q divided by K effective times length. What is the length is L, is capital L. So it's capital L times the viscosity divided by, what's the cross-section area? I, what's the AI? Is capital H, right? Can I say capital H is equal to small h? Yes, yes. so cross-section area is equal in all samples. So A cross-section area of sample one is equal cross-section area sample two all the way to the area total. They're all the same. 
So I just write it like A, area, cross-section area, because it's the same for all samples. This is equal to the potential drop of layer one. What would it be? Minus Q, Q1, which is equal to Q, because Q1, Q2, Q3, all are equal to Q total, times length of sample one. What's the length of sample one? L1 divided by K1 over A times viscosity. Then I have Q, L2 viscosity, K2 area, and so on to the end. I'm sorry, yeah, this is this potential drop one plus potential drop two plus potential drop three all the way to the end. Now I can cancel viscosity cross section area and Q, Q viscosity cross section area from all of them. And I finally arrive with the equation that L divided by K effective will be L1, K1, L2, K2, all the way to the end. That is called harmonic averaging. The averaging that we used in reservoir simulation without letting you know why. This is harmonic averaging that says K effective is, if I do the math, it will be L divided by L1 over K1 plus L2 over K2 plus L3 over K3 plus all of them. And we know that L here is L1 plus L2 plus L3, so it's total L. So summation of all small Ls, L1, L2, L3, L4, all the way to this. So I can say this is summation of Li's, which is L1 plus L2 plus L3, divided by summation of Li divided by Ki, which is L1 over K1 plus L2 over K2 plus L3 over K3. I have a question now for you. This is what we just did. And we have found that based on equal flow rates, in all sections, and knowing that the potential drop total will be summation of individual plot, uh, drops in each layer, we can come up with the effective probability to be harmonic average or weighted harmonic average to be precise. Since it's being recorded, I also show you the typed in thing. Q total is Q1, Q2 in every cross section QI. Each Q is velocity times cross section area. Total is the same formula with total cross section area and effective permeability and capital L. Potential drop across each sample would be, across each sample will be summed to give us the total potential drop. And that means potential drop across any cross section will be minus Li over viscosity and it will be divided by L. It's Li, this, and I have cross-section area, right? In my formula, I have cross-section area, yes. I have permeability, cross-section area. So that is Ai, cross-section area. And then at the end of the day, I find that L divided by effective permeability will be summation of Li's over Ki's, which is exactly what we just derived here. I have one question before the break. Imagine you have two grid blocks. One has K1, another has K2, permeability one, permeability two. They are with equal sizes. So this is L1, and this is L. So we call it 1L, or yeah, let's call it L1, L1. Both of them have the same size, L1. What would be the effective permeability between the two? What would be the K effective? 
we should do L total. What's the L total? Is L1 plus L1 because both of them have the same size. Divided by K effective becomes equal to L1 over K1 plus L2, L, L, L1 again because L is constant, L1 divided by K2. L1 plus L1 is what? Two times L1, right? Now, if I cancel L1 from all the parts, what would I get? I would get two times L1. I'm sorry, I did, I canceled L1. I get two over K effective will be one over K1 plus one over K2. L's are canceled which means this is K1 plus K2 divided by K1, K2. I make common denominator. Common denominator is allowing me write one over K1 plus one over K2 to be K1 plus K2 over K1 times K2. This means that K effective is what? I need to reverse the two and then bring two inside. It becomes two times K1, K2 over K1 plus K2. That would be the effective permeability of two systems, one with K1, another with K2, which have the same size. Remember in your reservoir simulation code when you had grid spaces constant, they were all delta X. And I said to you that the permeability in the interface can be said, can be found by harmonic average and do it two times K1, K2 over K1 plus K2. Or in your case, you had lambda. I said do two times lambda I, lambda J divided by summation. This is what you did in your flow modeling, in your reservoir simulation modeling course. That's exactly the specific case of harmonic average when your layers have the same size. Imagine L1 and L2 are the same and you want to just find effective property for only part of this sample with two layers there. And that's precisely harmonic average what you did in reservoir simulation. Okay. Now uh, I'm going to give you a break uh, and then we are going to, uh, we are gonna uh, pause. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, so we studied the effective property for horizontal and now vertical normal uh, layered systems. One was arithmetic averaging, another was harmonic averaging based system like this, this is harmonic averaging. And now the same concept holds if you have radial flow, by the way. So if you have layered system close to your well bore, uh, if they are parallel to your well, then we know that the total Q would be summation of individual flow rates. Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4, all these layer uh, flow rates will be summed together to give you the total flow rate. The only difference between the parallel Cartesian flow and radial flow here is that the formula for flow rate, which is velocity times cross-section area should be appropriately written. Cross-section area in radial coordinate is two pi h. This is the cross-section area, two pi h. And the velocity is logarithmically proportional to the coordinates. That's all. And you do exactly the same procedure to find what's the effective permeability. And surprise, surprise, for radial flow, the effective permeability for layered system of uh, aligned with the flow rate would be exactly the same as Cartesian flow. For the other one, which is you have like layered, which are normal to your flow rate. So you have one layer here, you have another layer around your well and so on. You do exactly the same philosophy here that potential drop or pressure drop if you have no gravity would be uh, given by Darcy's law. Again, cross section area is two pi h. And then you know that the total drop is summation of individual layers drop and that without gravity would be pressure drop 
and you do exactly the same stuff, you get that instead of total length here, instead of capital L, it's the ratio between the, your maximum R and your wellbore R divided by individual ratios. So that's still also harmonic average, but instead of L divided by LI over KI, you have logarithm of them uh, normalized by the, by the maximum R divided by the R well, which is this guy here, divided by each individual layer I and I minus one ratio. So this is more logarithmic and that's all. The rest is that you will, you will be just fine. So this is the same concept holds here. Darcy's law plus, assuming that the potential drop would be the summation of individual layers drop. The same concept would, would hold here. We focus mainly on these kind of Cartesian based systems, by the way. Okay, now let's go to finding effective properties for multidimensional systems with analytical approach. This was 1D system, whether we have layered of horizontal or vertical or normal to the flow direction, it's on 1D. We found an effective property. How about if we have multidimensional like this box? And each component, each box, each puzzle has its own permeability. What would be the effective permeability of this one? Naturally, finding effective property for multidimensional one analytically would be prone to approximations. We cannot find them accurately enough. We can have an estimation of maximum and minimum value because we are just using pen and paper. If you use your reservoir simulator that you developed in the other course, you can do a lot better, a lot better. Here, what I know is that I can only find upscale property of 1D with pen and paper. Now the question is, can I decompose this multidimensional system into several 1D systems? into several 1D systems. I know what to do with stack of layers, either horizontally or vertically. Can I use that science to help me estimate what the permeability of this multidimensional system could be? That's the scope of what we want to do. We want to do. So imagine we have only a 2D one here. Imagine I have a 2D box here. Don't go to 3D even. Let's go 2D. I have two ways to decompose this system into several 1D systems. One way is to assume that I am going to first find effective properties per columns. First, first find effective properties of each column, which is 1D then, and I know how to do that. Then I will replace them with just one quantity, and then I find effective property for the entire system because each would be just one number. Then I can do again 1D upscale. Alternatively, I could assume that this box is decomposed instead of column based, it's decomposed of row based layers. So first I do upscaling in these layers. And then I do the averaging across the 1D layers. So here I first, here, I first make it look like this with one value then I would find one effective parameter for it. So each individual layers would go away because I find an effective property across each domain. Here, I am going to find first a layered system because I'm gonna find effective properties for each layer first. Then I am going to find an effective property for the entire box. 
So I'm going to do 1D, 1D, 1D until I find this. I'd like to ask you one question. What do you think the first approach would give me? Would it be the upper, the highest estimation or lowest estimation? If I do first averaging across the columns, then across this section. What type of averaging should I do for, these, for this column only? Only for this column. Then I wanna get rid of all these layers. Harmonic or arithmetic? Arithmetic. Arithmetic, absolutely, because these are layered to the flow. Imagine my flow rate is in X direction, by the way. So this is all flow rates that go through these layers. So first I do arithmetic averaging to get to these. And then these layers, how would I average them to get to this one? What averaging should I use? Harmonic. Harmonic, fantastic one. Harmonic. What averaging would I use here instead? Average, uh, harmonic or arithmetic in the lower option? First, I do this, which is normal layers across the flow. So first I would do harmonic. harmonic. Harmonic, absolutely harmonic. Then I would do arithmetic average. Is harmonic giving me lower number or higher number compared to arithmetic average? That's the question that we have for now not much of experience with. Let's do that for equal numbers. Then the average would be equal. Imagine you have two layers. One is K, another is zero. What would be the harmonic average of flow across these two? Imagine their length is equal. K effective harmonic would be what? Two times K1, K2 over K1 plus K2. What's the K1, K? What's K2? Zero. What would be the multiplication of zero to K? Zero. So effective permeability would be zero. Because when the flow is happening across vertical layers, if one layer doesn't let the flow happen, no flow will happen. It's like a shale formation or blockage. It's blockage. We have blockage in our system. What would happen if I have parallel flow? If one layer is zero, another is K, what would be the K effective? K. L, L. It will be K plus zero divided by two. It's average, it's, it's, it's arithmetic average. So that would be half of the K. Because yes, the upper layer doesn't let any flow to happen, but the lower layer will allow Q to happen. So in, in general, when they are parallel layers, if one layer is blocking the flow, other layers would help the flow to happen. So arithmetic average would give you upper estimates of the flow. It's higher average than the harmonic one. So if you go through this approach, arithmetic first, then harmonic, you are gonna find the maximum bound, the max value. If you go first to harmonic, then to arithmetic, you are gonna find the lower bound or around minimum value. Why? Because imagine one of these layers is zero. You will block the entire layer from conducting a flow to happen. All of these all of these cells would be effectively averaged to zero. So you will find effective value zero here. But if you have this zero, if you do first arithmetic average, you're gonna find an average permeability across this column here. So you will get some K which is not zero, but is a small. But here you will, you will deactivate one of your main flow paths because one cell here is zero. But we know in reality, in fact, flow can come here and can circle around it and go the other way. But you're gonna block the entire because you're assuming it's 1D flow. Imagine you have another block here, zero, another block here, zero, another block here, zero. You're gonna block the entire 
layers. But if you are having that system here, this is zero, this is zero, and then this is zero, you're gonna find some average value for each layer. So you're gonna find some effective value, which is actually reality because you may have some flow here and then you go here, you go up and you go down here. You can, you can have a flow like this to happen. So the first would give you maximum bond, the, uh, the other one would give you minimum bond, okay? And if you go to the written, upper bound will be found with first arithmetic, then harmonic, lower bound will be found first harmonic, then arithmetic. Now I know that without much of lecture, I can just simply create an Excel file with you, and we do that together for 10 minutes, five minutes, and that would be really, understood a lot better than I teach you here. For now, we, all, you know, we covered this concept. I would like to share my Excel file and do this in Excel so you understand this. If you have Excel on your computer, just open it and let's develop an Excel file that does this upscaling for us. And it would be just fabulous to experience it together. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, uh, I have a question, Adi. Please, please go ahead. Um, so you say you have upper and lower boundary. Yes. If you want to simulate this in um, in reality, you say the upper boundary is most realistic. So no, it's not more, most. More, no, 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 no. You, I, 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 if I said no, if I was understood this way, that's not correct. I'm just saying that it is for this specific case that I have some blockage in each block. It's closer. Yeah. To what happens. It's only closer for this specific case. You know, the, what we know is that the reality is something between minimum and maximum. Yeah. Okay. And when you do reservoir simulation and you can do that, what you can do with reservoir simulation, do I have an empty space here? Let me use this space here. You have this box. You have 2D reservoir simulator developed already. So I am going to create this 2D box in my reservoir simulator that you have already. Give any permeability you like in this system. Then put one pressure constant here, P1, and put here P2. Make P2 zero, make P1 one. You can do that with the Richle condition, or you can actually put wells here with high well index. That would not be a problem. Whatever you can, you just put some vertical value here and some here, and no flow rate here no flow. Then you can find your, your pressure distribution across this sample, and you can find your velocity. If you go to the middle section, like this section, calculate velocity across each interface of this, and sum all these velocities up, you can find the total flux. Total flux, or U total, is summation of individual velocities, that would be minus k effective in x direction, mu p1, p2 minus p1 over l. This is flow-based upscaling, based upscaling. That actually gives you a numerical value with the numerical simulator instead of analytical approach to obtain what is your effective permeability in X direction. You can repeat the same practice for vertical direction. This is a lot more accurate than your estimation of 1D because here you would allow 2D flow happen because it's a 2D reservoir simulator. You allow twisted flow as well. This is still not perfect because you're still assuming 1D boundary conditions and all that. So it's an active research subject. People get their PhD on this subject. How can we upscale the process effectively? It's a massive research line, okay? But what I meant here, that's a great uh, comment that you gave so that I can uh, make it clear, that the reality stays something in between of the bonds. For this specific case, it appar apparently the maximum bond is closer to what the nature could do, but it's not perfect at all. And this is one example. The other examples, minimum might be the right, the, the closer one. Okay, thanks. Of course, thank you for, for asking this great question. So I'd like to uh, share my, my other screen, the Excel one. Let me see if I can find it among the 
one million on the screens I have. So now, would you please let me know if you see my Excel file? Yes. Okay, so we are going to develop a 2D upper and lower bound estimator for us as the end practice of this course. And that would be really useful, uh, useful uh, instrument for you as well. Let me, let me do that. And if you have opened your Excel file, please let me know so that we can go all together. Do you have your Excel file open? Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic. Yes. Let me, let me do this. I'm going to color this cell so that, uh, let me see if I can find the, how to color. Uh, does this color? Yeah, that's, that's the color, okay. So I'm going to color so that I show you, I have, I have two by two system, okay. So this is one rock, this is another rock, this is, let's say another rock, and this is another rock. I wanna just practice with two by two, just as, as a practice. So you have different colors here. So I'm going to merge these cells. Uh, if I can merge, uh, where are you? I don't, let me just merge. <laughs> Anyhow, I don't, I don't. The, next to the uh, two coins, you see the inverted P and next to the coins. So go left a bit more to the left. Yeah, now up one, yeah, that's it. Oh, fantastic. Who was that? Uh, Renz. Renz, okay, remember <laughs> your, your help and service to the class. <laughs> so this is the permeability I'm going to, to show here to you all. And then here is Delta X, which is a horizontal extension of each layer. Let's assume all of them are one meters, but you can change it there. Later, let's put Delta Y uh, and assume that the Delta Y is also equal. You can change it later. So I'm going to just central this and uh, center this so that it's all just clear. I'm going to write some permeability values here. Like imagine it is one, two, three, I don't know, six. It's just uh, very much random at this point. We are gonna change these values and see what will happen. Now we are gonna have flow in X direction in this system. Let's do flow in X direction. And I'm going to do K, therefore XX, because it's the flow in X direction. I'm going to find effective permeability in X direction. And I'm gonna do upper bound. So I do upper bound. Yeah. So how do I do upper bound? The upper bound is first arithmetic average between, between these columns because flow is in X direction. How flow is X direction? I just, I will delete it here, but this is flow in X direction. Okay, it doesn't let me do that, but uh, it is going to be like this. Oops. This is so anyhow, I cannot. So I hope that you understand the flow is in X direction. So it's like these arrows, okay? So that's, that's the flow in X direction. Okay, so first I am going to do what? I'm going to do arithmetic averaging between what cells? Someone who has not talked yet. Which arithmetic average should I do? I should do arithmetic average between columns. So I have one, what cell is this? Arithmetic between B2 and B3. I do arithmetic between B2 and B3, which is these two cells. So I'm going to do arithmetic between B2 and B3 then I'm going to do arithmetic average between C2 and C3. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to just color them somehow that you just uh, notice so I can just make one of them look uh, blue, another look orange. So arithmetic between B2 and B3. What that is, is equal to parenthesis, B2 times 
the depth of it plus B3 times its delta y divided by summation of the delta y's is k1 x1 plus k2 x2 divided by total x. It's arithmetic average, a weighted arithmetic average by weights of their depth. I can just make sure that this is dollar sign. If I put dollar sign, Xn would freeze these D2 and D3 because I can then simply copy the same formula, I think, to the next cell. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work, but I try to see if I can with Excel freeze this. So B2 and B3 permeabilities are being simply used and arithmetically averaged. Okay, let me enter. Is this correct? Average of one and three, is it two? Yes, one plus three divided by two is two, right? Average between one and three is two, right? So that's, that's, that's correct. I'm going to click on this button and then extend it to the next formula, which I can click and check if this is right. It says the average between C2 and C3, which is C2 times the delta Y plus C3, the delta Y of, of C3, divided by the summation of their delta Ys. That's the average and I enter correct. And the average between two and six is indeed four. That's correct. So I am happy so far with these formula. Just a little bit smaller so I get more space in my system. Okay. What do I do after I know that one and three are now being replaced by a block, which is two, Another one is a block, which is four. What would be the final upper bound? Final upper bound would be arithmetic or harmonic between these two blocks that are normal to the flow. Uh, harmonic? Absolutely, harmonic. I do harmonic between, what is this value? C8 and D8. What would be the harmonic averaging between this and this layer? This layer will have delta Y and here delta Y would be equal. Their, their thickness is one or two, two. Right? Their thickness is two because they are replacing the entire column here. They are replacing the entire column. Okay, so harmonic average between these two is what? Can you think about it? Two multiplied by two and four. Exactly, so it is equal. Total length, total length is the length between these two. What's the total length? Is B, four, which is this delta X plus the other one, plus this. This is the total length divided by, divided by length of the first column, which is B4, divided by its permeability plus length of the second column divided by its permeability. That's it. Okay. Okay, that's it. Now there will be a problem here. When you use permeability zero, you're gonna face two problem. Why? because you are dividing values with permeability. And when permeability is zero, a number divided by zero becomes infinity. So Excel would, would not like it. So what do we do is we are gonna now do another thing. What we are going to do is we are gonna make the common denominator, which is C8 
here and D8, I'm going to multiply everybody by C8 times D8. So multiply everybody by C8, which is permeability one and the permeability two. So multiply the nominator and the denominator by that same value. So it would be C8 multiplied by D8 to the denominator, which stays like that. Then multiply the first term by C8 times D8. It will be one C8 would cancel, and then I will get only D8. The other term, it will have C8 times D8 divided by D8. It will be C8. This is only mathematically multiplying and dividing with the same value C8 divided by D8. So Excel does not complain if I use zero permeability. That's all. And I'm going to enter. I, I can in fact even freeze my B because Bs are DX, DY. So I can just use it, but I'm not gonna use it later on. So I'm gonna just keep it like that. C8 times D8 multiplied by summation of the length, total length divided by B4, D8, C4, D8. And if I click enter, I get the harmonic value. That is the final, the final upper bound estimation of my formation value. Let's do the, I copy this, put it here. Let's do the lower bound. Let's do the lower bound in X direction. Lower bound, let's put it one row here. Do I have to do first arithmetic or harmonic? I need to do harmonic. Between what two values? B2 and C2. First I do harmonic average between B2 and C2. First I do this row based 1D then another row based 1D, which is harmonic. Again, harmonic between C, I'm sorry, B3 and C3. So I do harmonic. Then I get some values for the harmonic, which is the value for these layers. Then I should do arithmetic average between the values that I will find here, which is C10 and D10. So let's do that first, first uh, step here. And then the next step here. And then I get the final record here with let's say blue color. What is the harmonic between B2 and C2? B2 and C2 is length of B2, which is, this is equal, length of B2 plus length, so total length, so that's total length, this plus this, and I can phrase it total length divided by length of the first one divided by the permeability of the first one plus length of the second one divided by permeability of the second one. And I'm going to freeze. Oh, I'm sorry. what? Length of the first one divided by permeability one, length of the second one, which is C4. I'm sorry, it is C2. No, that's true, that's true. This is true. That's my harmonic average. Now to make the Excel like the case when B2 or C2 either is zero, I am going to again multiply the entire system with B2 times C2. 
nominator will stay like that. Denominator B2 times C2 divided by B2 will get C2. B2 times C2 divided by C2 will be B2. That would be my harmonic average between, if you're not speaking, please mute yourself. So this is going to be a harmonic averaging between C2 and B2. Between C2 and B2 with the length of B4 and C4. I'm going to click enter. I'm gonna get 1.3. I hope everybody has this value in there. Then I'm going to click on this plus icon here and extend it to the neighbor. The neighbor, I need to check what happened to the neighbor. So obviously it, it didn't work. It didn't work. Let me just delete it. See what, what I didn't freeze. B2, C2. Ah, because it will horizontally go to or is that. So I need to change it. Okay. The rest is that I have everything set. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to extend it and correct it because Excel does it wrong. My permeabilities are not C2 and D2 anymore. It's my permeability C2 will be B3 and oh, let me just write it again from scratch. This is equal. I do it from scratch moment. Equals total length arithmetic between B3 and C3. Total length between B3 and C3, between these two. What is total length? Is this plus this? That's the total length divided by the first length divided by the permeability of that one plus the second length divided by permeability of that layer. To make Excel like me, I am going to multiply B3 and C3 with this. So B3 times C3 will be multiplied with a nominator for the denominator. B3 times C3 divided by B3 will be C3. And B3 times C3 divided by C3 will be B3. Enter. I get four. Harmonic average between two and six is four. Arithmetic average between two and six, I'm sorry, the harmonic average between three and six is four. Between three and six, the harmonic average is four. That's the difference between three and four, between these two. Harmonic average between these first layers of one and two is 1 1.3. Harmonic average between three and six is four. Can we conclude that the harmonic average is not in the center, but closer to a lower value? Average of one and two is not 1.5, it's 1.3, so lower than 1.5. The average between three and six is not 4.5, it's four. Harmonic average is lower than the arithmetic average is closer to a lower value. Then finally, I need to do arithmetic average of these two layers, which means equal. Arithmetic average is easy, is the first permeability multiplied by the cross section area of it, plus the second permeability multiplied by the cross section area of it, because both are in dy, divided by total cross section area, which is dy plus d3. That is my total average. Here, I did another one, and this is another one. I have found a specific case for which upper and lower bound are precisely the same. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Now I can change my box and instead of one and two, I can say, let's imagine the first layer is homogeneous. Did everybody get by the way, these values? Now I wanna move on. This is exceptionally 
found a case that I randomly in inserted and I have exactly the same estimate for both the uh, upper and lower bound. Now imagine I do that. Imagine I block one of the cells. Imagine I say the first layer is homogeneous. So permeability is one in the, in the upper layer, is the same. Then what would I get? Is that my upper bound is 2.54, my lower bound will be 2.4. Now imagine I would do instead one of the blocks impermeable. One of the blocks does not allow flow to happen. My total estimation of permeability would drop, especially for the lower bound. I find that my first block will be totally impermeable, which is true. Imagine I make the other one also impermeable, the other block. My lower bound will give me zero permeability because harmonic average across this column and across, across this column and across this column would be zero. But arithmetic average between zero and three is 1.5. Arithmetic average between one and zero is 0.5 and harmonic average between the two will be some value non-zero. But simply these two diagonal blocks which are set to be zero because the lower bounds first finds the harmonic average between each row and then finds arithmetic average would find that the, if the harmonic average of this layer is zero, three and zero average, arith, uh, harmonic average is zero, harmonic average of zero and one is zero also. So both values here are zero. So then it would make arithmetic average of two zero value will give you zero. So lower bound will give you zero while the upper bound would give you some probability there. Now you can play with this Excel file and do whatever you want to find out if you have, let's say 10 here, what will happen? If you have, for example, four here, what would happen? Now I have one question. You see the upper and lower bounds are not significantly different here. They are different. I mean, this has 3.6, this is 2.6. Now I can even make, I don't know, I can make this to be five. Then you give, you see, you see 3.7, 3.1. So you can really find, you know, play with this. You can make all of them be homogeneous. Obviously, when all of them are homogeneous, you should find effective properties are exactly the same. It's four. Upscaling is the same because it's, it's homogeneous medium. Why do you think that lower and upper bounds are not so significantly different in this case? It's a very small reservoir. Absolutely, Renz. It's a two, two, two by two system. You don't really have multidimensionality here too much. If you make for your homework, if you make n by n or 10 by 10 or five by five or so, you are gonna see a lot more effect of, of multidimensionality. But the concept stays the same. So that's exactly about, about finding an upscale value. Now, what we did is in x direction, right? You can absolutely do the same thing for flow in y direction. Flow in y direction, which would assume that the flow would go this way. Then you would, you would as if you have rotated your sample by 90 degrees. You would find different arithmetic and harmonic here. For the k, y, y, upper bound, let's do just only this. For the upper bound, what arithmetic averaging would you do if flow is vertical? Flow is in a y direction. You first do arithmetic average between, flow is in y direction, between these two, which were harmonic before, which means you would do first between arithmetic average of B2 and C2, then you would do, then you would do arithmetic average of B3 and C3. First, you would do arithmetic average of these two and then these two, and then you would do harmonic average because flow is vertical from top to bottom or bottom to top. You need to just imagine that. It's 90 degrees rotated. 
And then you would do a harmonic average of the values that you have found. So if you do that, practice yourself at home. And it, I would encourage you, please do that. It would take you very uh, little time. You will find that in general, your K, this is not XX, sorry, this is YY. Your KYY and KXX estimations can be really different. Can be different. Especially when you make this, for example, one, you make it one, you do, I don't know, you make it heterogeneous. You can see that K estimation of your X direction flow are different than estimation for Y flow. So effective probability in X is different than Y. And that's exactly an isotropicity, which means Kx towards the flow is different than Ky. Flow in X might be able to easy flow than in the Y. And that's, that's all. So uh, I hope that today you actually learned a few things that are extremely important for reservoir engineers uh, and practices about the upper and lower bonds for, for the flow, the concept of heterogeneity, the concept of anisotropy, and also how to analytically upscale and find effective probability for 1D reservoir. And for multidimensional reservoirs, we could find some sort of bonds of maximum minimum range of it. And we know reality is something in between. So with that, I wish you all the very best. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen and record and I would take you